Hello everyone, I am Dr. Purnashree and we will be discussing question papers in orthodontics. This is the part 3. So, today we will be discussing the topics Habits, Orthodontic Diagnosis, Cephalometrics, Skeletal Maturity Indicators and Model Analysis. So, let's move to the first topic, Habits. So, we have a short essay here. Classify habits and mention the management of thumb sucking habits. So the first part of the question is classify habits. So we can start by defining habit. Habit is a tendency towards an act or an act that has become repeated performance. It is relatively fixed, consistent, easy to perform and almost automatic. So you can divide this definition into parts and then you can learn it. Then we'll classify the habits. So oral habits can be classified in many ways according to different authors. I'll just show you the different classifications. You can learn any two or three of them for you to write. So they can be classified as obsessive or deep rooted or non-obsessive which can be easily learned and easily dropped. And then they can be further classified into intentional or meaningful habits and then masochistic or self-inflicting or injurious habits and then non-obsessive can be classified into unintentional and functional habits uh, you can write down the examples for these going to the next classification we have by William James he divides them into useful habits and the harmful habits Maurice and Bohanna divide habits into pressure non-pressure and biting habits then we have classification by Kingsley where he divides into functional habits, muscular habits, combined muscular habits and postural habits. Then there is classification by Ernest Clean, intentional and unintentional habits. And then by Sidney Finn, compulsive, non-compulsive habits. Then according to the cause of the habit, we have physiologic habit, pathological habit. And then Graeber has divided the causes of malocclusion and he uh, puts habits in the general factors causing malocclusion. And then based on the origin of habit, the habits can be divided into retained habit and a cultivated habit. So that we finish the classification of habits. Now going to the second part of the question. Management of thumb sucking habits. Thumb sucking is a form of non-nutritive sucking and it starts as early as 29th week of gestation. So then you can, this will be the introduction, then you can write the definition which is the placement of thumb in varying depths into the mouth. So thumb sucking and finger sucking together are called the digit sucking habits. You can, uh, they've asked for management, but you can shortly just mention the diagnosis. The diagnosis will be based on the history, emotional status, extraoral examination, and the intraoral examination of the patient. Then coming to treatment, uh, treatment consists of counseling of patient. Then there's reminder therapy such as thumb guard, chemical means ACE bandage approach. Then there's a reward system where you, uh, you can give small rewards or a positive reinforcement to the patient. And there is adjunctive therapy. This can be a habit breaking appliance, either removable or fixed. So you can uh, explain these things in detail, each of these approaches. Then coming to the next question, classify mouth breathers and describe the design and role of oral screen in the same. So we have three parts. Classify mouth breathers is the first part, then the design and then the role of oral screen. So then you can start again with the definition of habits. Classification of the mouth breather. So mouth breathing is defined as habitual breathing through mouth instead of the nose. This was given by Sassoni. Then the classification is anatomic so anatomic means there is a defect in the anatomy like there can be a short upper lip which prevents closing of the mouth so the patient continues to breathe through the mouth 
then there is obstructor so there is something obstructing the airway and that is why the patient has to breathe through the mouth and there is habitual so even once the patient maybe he would have had a obstruction after the removal of obstruction also the patient continues to breathe through the mouth so because this has become a habit so that is habitual mouth breathing this is this is the classification given by finn then uh, coming to the design of the oral screen and role of oral screen oral screen is the most effective way to treat mouth breathing then it is uh, made up of acrylic which is compatible and then we uh, when we give a oral screen we should not completely block the airway for the patient some amount of passage for uh, exchange of air should be maintained in case of mouth breathers and if the patient has no difficulty breathing through nose such as habitual mouth breathers we can use oral screen this is the ideal treatment and then during initial phase to allow a uh, passage of air some windows are made and then this appliance is worn for 2 to 3 hours in the day and then full time during sleeping so this also can be used in other uh, habits such as lip biting tongue thrusting thumb sucking whereas in mouth breathers it prevents breathing through the mouth uh, coming to the short notes what are the effects of thumb sucking so effects you can write it down under extra oral examination and intra oral examination in extra oral examination you can write about the digits how there is a clean nails and then there is a rough and callous is present then on the lips you can see the lip uh, is short hypotonic and hyperactive lower lip is present and there is incompetency then the facial form uh, you can look for mandibular retrognathism maxillary protrusion and there is usually a convex profile is seen then on intraoral examination maxillary anterior teeth are proclined mandibular teeth are retroclined because of the pressure from the thumb uh, you can see here when the patient applies child he places the finger like this he applies uh, anterior force on the upper teeth that is why they proclined and the lower teeth because of this pressure from the thumb this way the lower teeth retroclined then because the thumb is always placed in the mouth there is an anterior open bite and because of the buccinator muscles contraction during sucking there is a posterior cross bite and also constriction of the maxillary arch then effects the other effects given by Johns, johnson and larson so these are the general effects on the maxilla mandible and the interarch relationship uh, this you need not write this much for a short note but uh, if it comes for a short essay you can write these things then there are uh, he has given effect on lip tongue and the other effects coming to our next topic orthodontic diagnosis so we have a short essay here and some short notes the short essay is cephalic and facial index this is very simple so these two indexes were given by Martin and Saller. You can remember the author's name. So cephalic index is basically head maximum skull width divided by the skull length. So based on that into 100. So based on this ratio, it is divided into dolicocephalic or long skull, mesocephalic or average skull, brachycephalic and broad skull. These are the ratios for each of them. Then we have the facial index again given by Martin and Seller. This is calculated by morphological facial height that is from nasion to the menton and the bizygomatic width. Then again we have three uh, facial types mesoprosopic or average face, uriprosopic or brachyfacial we can call it. It is a short broad kind of face. Then leptoprosopic or a dolicofacial. This is a long narrow type of face. So these are the values that you have to write for each and which indicate the ratio for these type of face types. 
Next question is what are the ideal requirements of orthodontic mod study models? Explain Ashley Ho's analysis. So this can come as a question under study models chapter also. Uh, so you can start writing by what are study models that is study model or plaster reproduction of teeth and the surrounding tissue. Okay, so both teeth and the soft tissue that provide a reasonable representation of occlusion of the patient. Then you can in short mention the parts anatomic artistic portion under anatomic we have the soft tissue and the tooth portion. These are the ideal requirements. They should rep accurately reproduce the teeth and the soft tissues. They should be symmetric. Sh they should show the occlusion of the patient when we place them on the back. And then they should be trimmed in such a way that they can replicate the measurements. They, sh they should be clean, smooth, bubble free. And they should have a glossy, mar proof appearance. They should have, they should be smooth. Coming to the third part of the question that is Ashley Ho's analysis. Uh, so Ashley Ho, they consider tooth crowding. The cause of tooth crowding is due to the difference in the arch width rather than the arch length. So he, it suggests this analysis suggests that width of all 12 teeth mesial to second molar and the width of dental arch and the first premolar region. These two measurements have a relationship so they have given three measurements that we have to calculate total tooth material premolar diameter and premolar basal arch width based on that they are given an inference so if the premolar basal arch width is more than the premolar diameter that means expansion is possible in case it is less the premolar basal arch width is less than the premolar diameter then either there is no need of treatment or the extraction may be needed or the teeth can be moved distally to a wider part. This is one part of the inference. The second part is calculation of basal arch width percentage. So percentage we calculate by basal arch width into 100 by total tooth material. So based on the percentage, if it is 37 to 44 percent, we call it a borderline case. If it is less than 37%, it is indicated for extraction. And if the value is more than 44%, it is a non-extraction case and can be probably treated by expansion. With that, we finish this answer. Next question is, list the various radiographs used in orthodontic diagnosis. Describe in detail cephalometric radiography. So the different radiographs that are used, they can be intraoral radiograph, that is occlusal, periapical and bite wing. And then there is extraoral radiographs such as panoramic, lateral oblique, skull projections where we have the lateral cephalogram, anterior posterior cephalogram, water's view, <coughs> reverse down, submento vertex and the then there is the hand wrist radiograph. Moving to the second part of the question. That is, uh, describe in detail cephalometric radiography. So, first you can write about the types, that is lateral and the frontal cephalograms. And then the, in short, you can write about the history. That is, it was introduced by Broadbent in the USA in 1931. And in the same year, even Hofarth in Germany, he also introduced this. And then there are the uses. Uses are diagnosis, treatment planning, classification, evaluation of treatment, predicting growth and also for research. Then you can write about the equipment, the cephalostat and the film size, then the positioning of patient, how far they should be from the cephalostat, how should they be placed. In short, you can write about the landmarks, you can just mention the names of the landmarks used and the different planes, horizontal and the vertical planes that are commonly used. And you can mention the names of the analysis, most commonly used cephalometric analysis. So if uh, all this will include the details of the cephalometric radiograph. Next we have the short notes, Poorman cephalometric analysis. So the lateral view, the lateral 
photograph on the profile view of the patient is called the Poorman cephalometric analysis. So it is called so because when we do not have a cephalogram, we can look at the profile and we can uh, diagnose if it is a class 2 or a class 3 skeletal uh, problem. So to establish whether the jaws are placed proportionately in anterior posterior plane on space. Then we draw two lines, one from bridge of the nose to base of the upper lip and another one uh, from that point from base of the upper lip to the chin. So if these two lines are, uh, they are make a convex profile that means the patient has a skeletal class 2. If it is concave then the patient has a skeletal class 3 and if it is straight line that is normal. It is class 1. Next question. Is Kessling's diagnostic setup. So the Kessling diagnostic setup was given by Kessling, H.D. Kessling, in 1956. This is a supplemental diagnostic aid. So here, what we do is we, the individual teeth and the attached alveolar process is sectioned, and then it is set up in the desired position. So that is why it is called a diagnostic setup. To, uh, and why do we set up? We set up according to the plant tooth movement. You know the place where the teeth, we want the teeth to lie after the treatment. So based on these movements, we can decide whether we have to extract the teeth or which way the teeth have to be moved or how the teeth have to be moved. That's about the diagnostic setup. Next question is Y axis. So Y axis is the angle between cella, gnathion and the FH plane, this angle. So usually it is 59 degrees, the mean value is 59, the range is 53 to 66 degrees is uh, considered the average. So it is increased in a class 2 or a vertical growth pattern and it is decreased in a class 3 facial patterns or a horizontal growth pattern. Gnathostatic models. So this was given by Simon. So what does gnathostatic model mean? Is that the upper surface of maxillary cast is parallel to the Frankfurt's horizontal plane. Okay, then these casts are oriented to the mid-palatal raphe, tuberosity plane and the occlusal plane for study cast analysis. So when we make the cast in this way, when we orient to these planes, it helps in three-dimensional assist, uh, assessment of the maxillary and mandibular dental arches and their occlusal relationships. The next question is cephalostat. So cephalostat is also called as a head holder or a cephalometer. It holds the patient's head uh, using two fixed ear rods and then the head is centered in the cephalostat and it is oriented parallel to the Frankfurt horizontal plane. So this is the positioning of the patient in a cephalostat and the mid sagittal plane is vertical and parallel to the cassette. That's about the cephalostat. Next topic is cephalometrics. So the long essay question here is enumerate various cephalometric analysis. So I've uh, written down few commonly used examples. There are multiple analysis. These are the uh, more commonly used cephalometric analysis that you can write. And then the second part is explain Steiner's cephalometric analysis and add a note on disadvantages of cephalometry. So first let's discuss the Steiner cephalometric analysis. So the Steiner's analysis was given by Steiner in the 1950s. So it is considered the first of modern cephalometric analysis. Okay, so it's not the first analysis, but the first modern cephalometric analysis because it displayed measurements in such a way that it did not emphasize not just on individual measurements, but the relationship. Then uh, the second reason is it offered specific guides for use of cephalometric measurements in treatment planning. So it helped in diagnosis as well as the treatment planning. Then uh, coming to the third part. Uh, that is disadvantages of cephalometry that is 
the cost of this affluentry then there is sensor dimension the sensors the that is the film and the cassette and then there is risk of cross infection the medical legally uh, sometimes these ma- uh, images the digital images can be manipulated so manufacturers of programs of the software digital software have installed a audit trail which can track down the and recover the original image uh, also in uh, stenus analysis you can write down the common uh, the dental and the skeletal variables that we measure and the mean values of that you can if you can you can draw a diagram and uh, mention the angles and the linear measurements that are used in stenus analysis uh going to the next question we have short essays again describe stenus analysis so same thing you can give, you can write uh, who has given it that is stener what is the analysis and then the skeletal and the dental parameters in it and then add a note on drawbacks of cephalometrics that we've just done then another question that can come as a short essay is what are uses of cephalograms in orthodontics explain stenus analysis so we just discussed this in the long essay then there are short notes y axis and cephalic index this also i have just discussed in the previous topic uh downs analysis can be asked as a short note so downs analysis was given by wb downs in 1956 so downs considers the position of mandible could be used in determining whether or not the faces are balanced so based on this he has given four facial types retrognathic mesognathic or average prognathic where there is a prominent lower face and there is true prognathism a pronounced protrusion of the lower face you can also add uh, this is a short note but you can also add uh, the dental and the skeletal and linear and the angular parameters used in downs analysis the next topic for today is skeletal maturity indicators here we have a short essay describe the anatomy of the hand so here you can draw this diagram mention that these are the phalanges label it well and then the metacarpals and then the carpals so here we have a way to you can use this mnemonic to memorize the metacarpals this is the thumb side this is the little finger the last fifth uh, finger she looks too pretty and then try to catch her so this is the mnemonic that you can use so she s stands for scaphoid looks lunate two is for triquetrum pretty pretty is pisiform okay then again we start from the thumb side try to catch her uh, another way so that you don't get confused trapezium is near the thumb so you can find this letters um here and um in the thumb also and trapezoid is inside the it's on the second phalanx so it's near the second phalanx so it is id here in the trapezoid and inside also has id so this way this is a mnemonic to remember the carpals uh the next part of the question is mention the uses of hand wrist radiographs and any one method of evaluating hand wrist radiograph in orthodontics so these are the uses of the hand wrist radiographs uh they are mainly used when there is a discrepancy between the dental and the chronological age they can be used before the use of a rapid maxillary expansion treatment planning for class 2 and class 3 cases when functional appliance is an option to predict future skeletal maturation rate and the growth status to predict the pubertal growth spurt and then to predict the skeletal age of the patient and can be also used in research activities then uh, these are the methods we have for skel- uh, hand wrist radiographs that is fishman skeletal maturity indicator method bjor grave brown method hag and taranger method atlas of grulich and pile c 
singers method so you can write any one of the method which you are comfortable you can draw the hand wrist radiograph write down the stages various stages of whichever method you want to uh, answer next question is what are skeletal maturity indicators explain the bjork grave and brown's method of assessing hand wrist radiographs so we define skeletal maturity assessment as visual inspection of developing bone and their initial appearance sequential ossification and the related changes in size and shape so this is skeletal maturity assessment so what are skeletal maturity indicators provide objective diagnostic evaluation of stage of maturity in an individual so we first assess it and then we uh, based on the assessment we indicate the stage of maturity in an in an individual coming to the bjor grave and brown analysis of hand wrist radiographs this was given initially by bjor and then it was modified by grave and brown in 1976 they divided the uh, hand wrist radiograph from age 9 to 17 into nine stages so you can draw this diagram if you uh, and then you can mention the changes starting from stage 1 2 3 4 5 here also 6 7 8 and 9 you can uh, write down this coming to the short notes hand wrist radiographs they can be if they are asked as a short note uh, you can just write that hand wrist radiograph consists of small numerous small bones which show a predictable sequence of ossification from birth to maturity so this ossification of bones is a standard for skeletal development so based on this we calculate the skeletal age and then you can also mention uh, the three stages in ossification of phalanges and if you can you can draw this diagram also uh, the three stages are when the epiphysis and the diaphysis uh, is initially the epiphysis is smaller than the diaphysis then they become equal then there is capping and then there is fusion of the epiphysis and the diaphysis next topic for today is model analysis here we have uh, the short essay this is the last topic for today boltins analysis boltins analysis it says there is a ratio between the meso distal width of maxillary and the mandibular teeth so this helps in determining if there is a tooth size discrepancy between the upper and the lower teeth so there are two ratios here there is a overall ratio and an anterior ratio in overall ratio using the sum of mandibular 12 teeth that is from first molar to first molar and the sum of maxillary 12 teeth using this formula we get the overall ratio so if this ratio is less than 91.3% that means there is a maxillary tooth material excess to calculate how much is the maxillary tooth material excess we use this formula same way if the ratio is more than 91.3% that means there is a mandibular tooth material excess and this is the formula we use to calculate the amount of mandibular tooth material excess same way to calculate the anterior tooth ratio that is sum of mandibular 6 divided by sum of maxillary 6 so when we say maxillary 6 or mandibular 6 we mean canine to canine into 100 if this ratio is less than 77.2% that means there is a maxillary tooth material excess this is the formula to calculate the amount of excess and if the ratio is greater than 77.2% there is, that means there is a mandibular anterior tooth material excess and this is the formula to calculate that the short notes are moyer's mixed dentition analysis so moyer used the sum of lower four incisors to predict the meso distal width of premolars and the canine uh, and he there is a moyer's prediction value using the sum of these lower four incisors and the prediction value we can 
estimate the size of the canine in the premolar which appraisal so which appraisal was given by johnston and then it relates point a and b to the occlusal plane pro providing a measurement of the anterior posterior relationship of the jaws so two perpendicular lines are drawn from point a and point b onto the occlusal plane and a measurement is made in millimeters usually it is 1 mm for men and 0 mm in women so if there is a positive reading if that means if there is a greater reading than these average values it means there is a skeletal class 2 malocclusion and if the value is lesser than these values the average value it means there is a skeletal class 3 malocclusion the other questions again is bolton's anterior ratio moyer's mixed dentition analysis this we have discussed and with this we come to the end of today's discussion thank you for watching this video and if you have any questions doubts or suggestions please leave it in the comment section below